Into the Ice, The Story of Arctic Exploration, by Lynn Curley. What kinds of obstacles would a polar explorer encounter? Genre. Narrative nonfiction often recounts a series of events. Look for a number of related events as you read. The great pioneer in search for the North Pole was a brilliant young Norwegian scientist named Fritjof Nansen. Also an athlete, outdoorsman, artist, and poet, Nansen wrote of the strange atmospheric effect called the Northern Lights. The aurora borealis shakes over the vault of heaven its veil of glittering silver, changing now to yellow, now to green, now to red. It shimmers in tongues of flame until the whole melts away in the moonlight, like the sigh of a departing spirit. In 1888, at the age of 26, Nansen organized his first expedition a trek across Greenland on skis, a feat never before accomplished. Dropped off by ship on the uninhabited east coast, Nansen and five companions had no choice but to ski westward to civilization, carrying only the provisions required for the one-way journey. This kind of bold yet calculated risk-taking was typical of Nansen. He carefully planned every detail, even designing his own equipment. He also knew how to improvise off the land, adopting Inuit methods such as the use of dog sledges, kayaks, and snow houses. After the Greenland trek, Nansen became interested in the idea of polar drift. In 1884, in the ice near Greenland, some debris was found from the Jeannette, a ship crushed in the ice off Siberia in 1881. There was only one possible explanation. The ice and debris had drifted around the entire Arctic Ocean. Nansen had a breathtaking proposal. He would sail a ship directly into the ice pack off Siberia, deliberately let it be frozen in, and drift with the ice across the top of the world, penetrating the heart of the Arctic. Nansen's small ship, the Fram, onward in Norwegian, was specially designed with a hull that would ride up over the crushing ice, and living spaces insulated with cork and felt. Fully provisioned with scientific equipment and supplies for five years, the Fram had workshops, a smithy, and even a windmill for electricity. On June 24, 1893, the Fram sailed from Norway. By September 25th, Nansen and his crew of 12 were frozen fast in the polar ice pack off Siberia. As they drifted slowly northward, the expedition settled into a routine of scientific observation. The ship was so comfortable that by the end of the second winter, Nansen was restless and bored. Now only 360 miles from the North Pole, Nansen decided to strike out over the ice. In the Arctic dawn of mid-March 1895, Nansen set out with one companion, Halmar Johansen, three sledges of provisions, 28 dogs, and two kayaks. As in Greenland, 
there could be no turning back. This time, their home base was drifting. For three weeks, they struggled northward, maneuvering the sledges over jumbled fields and immense ridges of broken ice. By early April, they were still 225 miles from the pole, and the drifting ice was carrying them south almost as quickly as they could push north. Provisions were also running low, so they reluctantly headed for the nearest land, 300 miles to the south. As the weeks passed and the sun rose higher, the broken surface of the ice pack became slushy, then treacherous, as lanes of water called leads opened and closed between the ice flows. It took four months to reach land. After provisions ran out, the men survived by hunting seals in the open leads and by feeding the weak dogs to the stronger ones. Nansen and Johansen finally found a remote island. With no hope of rescue, the two men prepared for the winter, building a tiny hut and butchering walrus and bears for a supply of meat and warm furs. They survived the winter in isolation, burning greasy blubber for heat and light and growing fat on the diet of oily meat. When the ice broke up in the spring, Nansen and Johansen set out in their kayaks. On June 13, 1896, one year and four months after leaving the Fram, they were picked up by an English expedition. Two months later, the Fram and its crew broke free of the ice in the ocean east of Greenland, more than a thousand miles from their starting point. The scientific expedition was a triumphant success, and Nansen and Johansen had gone farther north than anyone had before. Now, the race to the North Pole was on. Another daring attempt was made the very next year. A flight to the pole in a balloon. Solomon André was a Swedish engineer with experience in aeronautics and an interest in the Arctic. He had built a large hydrogen-filled balloon with a passenger gondola designed to hold three men, four months of supplies, sledges, and a small boat. Developed more than 100 years earlier, balloons were still the only means of flight in the 1890s. As transportation, they have serious limitations. First, they cannot be steered. And second, they are sensitive to temperature changes. André tried to solve the first problem with a complicated system of sails and drag lines. He completely ignored the second problem, and the result was disastrous. In midsummer 1897, the Ornen, eagle in Swedish, lifted off from Spitsbergen, an island north of Norway. As they sailed northward, André wrote in his journal, The rattling of the drag lines in the snow and the flapping of the sails are the only sound, except for the whining of the wind. As the balloon was alternately heated by the sun and cooled by freezing fog, the precious gas that kept them aloft leaked away. By the third day, the Ornan was down on the ice, 200 miles from land. In the Arctic summer, at the edge of the ice pack, André and his two companions faced a terrifying world of slushy, grinding flows and open leads. It took them three months to struggle to the nearest island. 
but inexperienced and unprepared, they were unable to survive the winter. We know what happened only because 33 years later, their frozen remains were found. Along with Andre's journal and another eerie relic, undeveloped images of the doomed expedition that were still in their camera. Physically, the North Pole is nothing more than a theoretical point on the Earth's surface. But reaching it came to symbolize mankind's mastery of the entire planet and a landmark human achievement. An American naval engineer desperately wanted to be the first explorer to stand on the North Pole. Robert E. Peary first entered the Arctic in 1886. For 20 years, he mounted expeditions to northwest Greenland, looking for the best route north. Peary was not particularly interested in scientific discovery or mapping. He had one goal, the glory of being first. Over the years, Peary came to believe that it was his destiny to conquer the North Pole. Vain and arrogant, Robert Peary ran his expeditions like a military campaign. His chief lieutenant was his personal assistant, Matthew Henson, a man of African descent. This was unusual at the turn of the century, but then Peary was unconventional in many ways. He also took his wife on some of his early expeditions. Josephine Peary was the first white woman in the high Arctic, and she gave birth to their daughter while on expedition. Inuit came from miles around to see the newborn blonde snow baby. As an explorer, Peary was innovative, taking ideas from everyone and improving on them. But the polar Inuit were the key to his success. Inuit women made his furs, and Inuit men used their own dogs to pull his sledges. They built his snow houses on the trail and hunted for his meat in exchange for metal tools and other material goods. On one occasion, Peary pushed himself so relentlessly that his feet froze. When his fur boots were removed, several of his toes snapped off. As soon as the stumps healed, he was back on the trail. In 1906, Peary made a full-scale assault upon the North Pole. His plan was to take a ship as far north as possible, winter over in Greenland or the Canadian Islands, then strike out for the Pole in late February, before the ice pack started breaking up. The Arctic did not cooperate, however. When only a hundred miles out on the ice pack, the expedition was delayed several days by a broad lead. Then, a blizzard kept them campbound for another week. Supplies dwindled, and the disappointed Peary had to settle for a new farthest north record, 175 miles from the pole. After another appeal to the men who financed his expeditions, Peary sailed from New York in July 1908 in the Roosevelt, named for Theodore Roosevelt, then President of the United States and the explorer's most enthusiastic supporter. Peary was 52 years old, and he knew that this was his last expedition. But Peary was not the only explorer in the Arctic in 1908. There was also Dr. Frederick A. Cook, a veteran of both the Arctic and the Antarctic, which was just then being explored. Cook 
had been the physician on one of Peary's earlier expeditions. Always jealous and overbearing, Peary had refused to allow Cook to publish an article about his experiences, and they had quarreled. Now the doctor was rumored to be thinking about his own attempt on the North Pole. Peary dismissed the rumors. He considered Cook an amateur, not in the same league as himself. On March 1, 1909, Peary stood on the frozen shore of the Arctic Ocean and faced north. With him were 23 men, 19 sledges, and 133 dogs. For the next month, Matt Henson led out in front, breaking trail, while Peary rode a sledge in the rear, supervising the troops. Other sledges traveled back and forth, relaying tons of supplies northward, provisions for the return trip that were stored in snow houses, strung out over almost 500 miles of floating, shifting ice. Everything had been carefully calculated, down to the sacrificing of weak dogs to feed the strong. For the final dash to the pole, Peary took only Henson and three Inuit. The entry in his diary for April 6, 1909, reads, The pole at last, the prize of three centuries, my dream and ambition for 23 years, mine at last. Or was it? Peary came home to the stunning news that Dr. Cook had already returned, claiming to have reached the North Pole on April 21, 1908, a year before Peary. In the investigations that followed, Peary accused Cook of lying and it was demonstrated that Cook had lied once before when he claimed to have climbed Mount McKinley in Alaska, North America's highest peak. Lacking documentation or witnesses, except for two Inuit companions who said they were never out of sight of land, Cook's claim to have reached the pole was officially rejected. Then, incredibly, Peary was also unable to completely verify his own claim. The careful explorer was a sloppy navigator, and from his solar observations and daily journal, it was impossible to say that he had stood at the pole. Henson and the Inuit were unable to take solar readings, so it was Peary's word against Cook's. Commander Robert E. Peary was finally given the credit and made a rear admiral. But his great prize was tarnished, and he died an embittered man. As for Cook, he vowed until his dying day that he had reached the North Pole. In recent years, historical researchers have determined that neither man actually stepped foot on the northernmost part of the globe. The classic era of Arctic exploration ended with Peary. Attention then shifted to the Antarctic and to the South Pole, which Roald Amundsen reached in 1911. Three years later, the world was at war, and most exploration was postponed. When it resumed in the 1920s, the world was a different place. Balloons were no longer the only means of flight, and several attempts were made to fly to the North Pole in small airplanes. For many years, Richard E. Byrd was given credit for the first successful flight, but his claim is now disputed. In 1926, Roald Amundsen flew across the entire Arctic Ocean in an Italian dirigible piloted by its designer, Umberto Nobile. The first person to stand at the North Pole, whose claim is undisputed, is Joseph Fletcher, 
a United States Air Force pilot who landed there in 1952. Arctic flights are great achievements, but they are achievements of technology, somehow different from crossing nearly 500 miles of shifting ice by dog sledge and then returning. Although many people have now stood at the North Pole, no one has ever completed Peary's journey without being resupplied by plane or airlifted out.